doing it without her. This meeting is being recorded. I also want to acknowledge uh, Christina Cook, um, who is our Zoom host tonight and um, doing all the slide sharing. And um, then also Marion um, Friedel and Susan Nossel, who are also monthly member, monthly um, meeting team members that are helping behind the scenes. So we have the recording on. So um, while we're waiting for a few more people to show up, if you could, um, in the chat, you can um, share your name, your, your location. If you're new, it would be great if you let us know if you're new. And then if you want to say, um, put in something about a signs of spring that you've been seeing. Tulips coming up, but the bunnies are eating them. Snowdrops, great. Better snowdrops than snowflakes. Mm -hmm. Burned prairies, yes, I saw some this weekend too. Where have, where are some of the ones they've been burning? Um, I saw some at the Arboretum. They're mm. just doing the smaller places in the parking lot so far, but um, it's been a little wet for doing big burns. Yeah. Coots on Monona Bay, chipmunks, yeah, chipmunks are definitely out. Okay. Looks like we still have people coming in, so we'll keep, get started here in a second. Work to be done on the farm, always. Weariness with snow. I think we all agree with that, Russ. Woodcocks, were they calling, Nikki? Election canvassers. <laughs> That's definitely a sign of spring. Exactly. That's a good one. So Nikki's dog ended up chasing chasing the woodcock. I guess even really well trained dogs chase woodcocks, huh, Nikki? Nikki's a dog trainer on her in her other hat. <clears throat> Sandhill cranes, of course, they've been back for a while. Okay, it looks like um, a lot of people have gotten themselves in, so I think we can go ahead and get ourselves started. So um, let's go on to the land acknowledgement slide. Okay, so if we can um, take a minute to take a few breaths together, and then um, what I, so that we can reflect on our on the land we're in. So tonight I'm showing you a photo of the still reflective water of Mirror Lake, which is well-named. It's a state park up in Sauk County. And to help us quiet our minds and prepare us for gathering together in our community of people concerned about the climate and our planet. With this, I want to acknowledge that we inhabit land that was cared for by the Ho-Chunk and other peoples for thousands of years before we caused the impacts that are leading us to our current climate challenges. We have much to learn from the indigenous people from around the world. Okay, I think we are ready then for Christina, if you could move on to your section. Yeah, thanks Kelly. Um, before we get to our speaker, um, we wanted to introduce something new that the monthly meeting team is kind of proposing and trying out. Um, so a lot of community organizations um, all over the place in all kinds of spaces um, will adopt, it goes by a variety of names. Sometimes it's called the code of conduct, which is the name we've chosen for now. Sometimes it's a community agreement, set of community norms, just kind of a way of expressing um, 
the goals that the community has for interactions in order to have a, a welcoming and inclusive community for diverse groups of people, which this, this organization definitely is. And we wanna uh, continue supporting supporting that in the, in the monthly meeting. So I think Marion will share in the chat a, a link that hopefully everyone can access to the draft of a code of conduct that we've put together with, I mean, it's in some ways pretty simple, hopefully, you know, things that are self-evident to us, but a way for us to write down, like, this is how we want to treat each other um, with courtesy and with respect um, so that we can have different people all in the same space and have everyone feel as safe and welcome as possible. So um, again, there'll be more information in the chat about this. Um, this is not like set in stone, last will and testament kind of thing. Um, we're interested in people's uh, thoughts, questions about it. Um, I think the contact information is at the bottom of the information, like the, the document you can contact anyone on the monthly meeting team. Um, and we hope that this will be, again, just a useful tool for ourselves as for many other community groups in um, continuing to have, honestly, in our, our case, a welcoming space for everybody. Thank you, Christina. So tonight, um, we are going to be having a presentation on the Ag Policies and Practices um, sub-team. And then after then after their presentation, then uh, we will have some uh, about 10 minutes for Q&A. And then we'll have um, about 20 minutes of updates for the upcoming events that are going on and to learn about some of the other teams on the um, of 350 Wisconsin. And after that, then it'll be time that if you are a newcomer, we would love for you to stay on the main meeting room and have Nikki talk with you. And then we'll also have two optional breakouts, one for talking to the speakers and one um, to talk about the, um, the April actions. So um, we're, I'm now going to have Steve Glass, who is a member of the Ag Policy and Practice team, and which is a sub-team of the 350 Wisconsin-Dane County Working Group. He will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, two climate leaders who will talk about the role of uh, agriculture and its contributions to climate change and what the local group is doing about it and plans to do about it. Before I introduce uh, Mike Friend and Harry Pulliam, I just want to put the problem of modern industrial agriculture and its contribution to global warming in context. And the topic is addressed in Greta Thunberg's excellent new book, The Climate Book. It's excellent and it's also terrifying. She talks a lot about the role of agriculture. And I wanna talk about two chapters in particular. One is the calorie question by Michael Clark. And he says, where our calories come from is a global issue. Food systems are argu arguably the single largest driver of environmental degradation. They produce 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions, occupy 40% of the Earth's land surface, and use at least 70% of the world's water. So the redesigning of food systems is terribly important and it's the next frontier in the fight against the climate and ecological crisis. So our two speakers tonight are local and regional climate leaders. They include Michael Friend, who leads the 350 Wisconsin Ag Policy and Practices team, which is a part of the Dane County Community Working Group within the Community Climate Solutions team. Mike also, Mike co-leads the Dane County Working Group with Kathleen Fitzgibbon. He became interested in agriculture in recognition of the many good things a farm can provide from nutritious food and education to carbon sequestration. He has spent the last few years working on a small intensive vegetable farm that provides summer youth employment and job training for people interested in agriculture as a career. His uh, partner in tonight's presentation is Harry Pulliam, 
was the vice president of the South Central chapter of the Wisconsin Farmers Union, where he works on policy initiatives at the statewide level. He is also on the executive committee of the Sustained Rural Wisconsin Network. Harry and his wife have a micro farm in Greene County, Wisconsin, where they produce vegetables and value added products. So Mike and Harry will talk for about 20 minutes and then there'll be about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I encourage you to put your questions in the chat room and we will try to get to them all during the Q&A period. If, but if we don't and some are held over, we will address those in one of the breakout rooms. So I will turn it over now to Michael Friend and Harry Pulliam. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Let me get my slides up on the screen for everybody. All right. Here we are. Can everybody see that? Excellent. Looks so good. thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming and giving us the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is agriculture's impact on climate and what we at 350 was Wisconsin can do about it. Before we begin, I want to say a couple of things. Oh, can I advance my slides? There we go. That's how I do it. The first is a big thank you to Dr. Diane Mayerfield at the UW-Madison Center for Integrated Agricultural Studies. Um, I'm using a slide and a lot of information from a presentation that she gave for this. So thanks, Dr. Mayerfield. I also want to say that there's I'll, I want to go into detail about a lot of this because I love this stuff, but we don't have the time. So if you have additional questions, even after the breakout room, I would refer you now to Greta Thunberg's climate book. Thank you, Steve. Uh, but also to Kiss the Ground, which is a documentary about regenerative agriculture that's available on Netflix. I also want to talk about a couple of terms, the first being soil health which is important because healthy soil is, uh, so is carbon sequestering soil. Healthy soil is full of life, of plant roots, of earthworms, bugs, fungi, um, all manner of living things supporting each other in a symbiotic ecosystem. Um, and that organic matter, things that are alive or used to be, um, are where carbon is sequestered in the soil. We produce healthy soil by disturbing this following four basic principles of disturbing the soil as little as possible. So not digging in it, not plowing it by keeping it covered as much as possible and planted as much as possible with as many different kinds of plants as possible. I also wanna talk about the idea of co-benefits which is an important idea in climate action in general, um, but specifically here, because farmers are business people who are trying to make a living off of their farms. Um, so if we want them to change their practices in the ways that we're talking about, they need those practices to make business sense um, if they're to be practical for farmers. Now, luckily, a lot of the practices we're going to talk about are good for the bottom line, in addition to being good for the climate and also water, biodiversity, human health, community health. There's a lot of good that comes off a of farm, like Steve said. Um, and I also want to turn it over to Harry for a couple of minutes to tell us about the term CAFO, which is one that we'll be using a couple of times in this presentation. Um, so Harry, could you tell us a little bit about what a CAFO is and why it's important here? If we, if we were in a room together, I would ask everybody to raise a hand and tell me what they think the word CAFO means. Fortunately, uh, Mike has uh, laid it all out here. It's a concentrated animal feeding operation. And uh, it's basically a, an arbitrary number that uh, the USDA has put together uh, defining the number of animals that uh, is one animal unit. So a dairy cow is about 1.2 to 1.4 animal units. One beef cow is about, um, is about one animal unit. And uh, most CAFOs, to be a CAFO, one has to have 1,000 animal units. So in the case of uh, beef cattle, 1,000 cows. Uh, when, the, when they say concentrated, what they mean is that they put these animals in a single confined space. The slide here shows hogs. Uh, and that's exactly how they live uh, for basically their entire lives. Uh, if they're in a gestation barn, each one of the sows is in a uh, a space about the size of a casket. 
and they stay there pretty much their entire lives. Uh, and then their feces fall through a, a, a metal grate into a pool below, and it's kept there for as long as uh, they can store it there, how much space they have. And then they usually pump, mix water with it and pump it out and spread it all over the ground. So that's, that's the way a CAFO works. Uh, these animals typically do not see the outside. They do not get on grass. Um, and uh, uh, they're primarily designed for what's called efficiency. You'll hear, hear that term efficiency uh, a lot when you're talking to people in the agribusiness sector. It's basically uh, the least you can do to make the most money. You want to talk about efficiency. And this is the least uh, uh, labor intensive way of producing uh, lots of meat uh, at very, uh, very low cost. Right. right. Yeah, as we're going to talk about in a second here, um, low, very low monetary cost, but there may be other costs associated with it. Um, so the next part of this presentation, I want to talk about the impact of climate uh, agriculture on climate, and we're going to start with the bad news. Um, in, as Steve mentioned, a large amount of greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, and this is the slide from Dr. Merrifield's presentation, which breaks down in the U.S. where within agriculture those emissions come from. So I want to talk through this briefly. Um, the largest portion of agricultural emissions come from uh, cropland soils, which is soils where we raise plants. So your corn, your soybeans, whatever plants you're growing. Um, and there are a few practices of concern within raising plants um, that I want to tell everybody about. The first being using synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, particularly nitrogen fertilizers. If nitrogen is applied to the land in quantities more than the plants can use, it gets emitted into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide. That's the N2O below cropland soils. Now that is laughing gas, but it's less funny when you know that nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas 300 times more potent than CO2. Um, additionally, not on this chart is the emissions that are associated with producing those fertilizers. Uh, they actually account for about 10% of United States agricultural emissions. Uh, it's a petroleum intensive process and the synthetic fertilizers are themselves petroleum products. Um, and there's also the emissions produced by transporting them. So we really want to minimize or eliminate the use of those chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Additionally, tilling the soil or plowing the soil actually produces a large amount of emissions, which may surprise you because that's one of the stereotypical farmer activities, right? But that's a problem for a number of reasons that I would really like to get more into detail in. Uh, just one example is, remember we said that healthy soil, it's best not to disturb it. Um, when you do plow soil, the organic matter within it is exposed to the air where microbes eat it and then respire it as carbon dioxide. And then finally, I wanna talk about monocropping, which just means planting just one kind of crop uh, in, one, in a place, so thousands of acres of corn which again is a problem for a number of reasons. Um, for the soil health, remember we said that it wants a diversity of plants. Think about if you were to only ever eat broccoli for your entire life. As nutritious as broccoli is, it's not complete nutrition for you, and it's the same for soil. The next section of the pie chart is entitled enteric fermentation, and that's the big science word for burping cows. So cows and sheep and other ruminants produce methane, that's the CH4 as part of their digestion. And there are so many of them uh, that when they burp it out, as largely that's how it comes out, um, it adds up to a really significant source of greenhouse gases. For this next slice, I'm gonna turn it over to Harry again. Um, this slice is titled Managed Livestock Waste, but that largely refers to livestock waste as it is, as it is managed on CAFOs. So Harry, you wanna tell us about that for a minute or two? So like I mentioned, we were talking about the hog barn there. Um, uh, typically, the, um, the in, in, in old style agriculture, I say old style anything before, say, 1945, um, uh, before it was called, before the new practices are called conventional agriculture, um, 
people used to shovel the, uh, say for instance, in dairy cattle, they would shovel the manure out of the barn. They'd put it into pile, sometimes compost it and spread it on the ground dry. Uh, and it was much less likely to run off into uh, streams and other surface waters. It was much less likely to infil infiltrate into the soil and corrupt groundwater. Uh, now what they do is they uh, basically flush it out of the stalls into a drain tile, which is about the size of a room of your house, uh, into a, uh, let's call it a cesspool as big as several football fields. It's called a manure lagoon. Beautiful name, isn't it? Uh, and from those manure lagoons, uh, you, um, uh, you can measure an awful lot of uh, methane coming off of them. And that is currently not captured at all, except if you wanted to um, build a manure digester. And we can talk about that at length. There's a lot of information on manure digesters. Uh, they are touted as, um, as the modern way to, uh, to control pollution. Uh, and it's kind of a myth. Um, the liquid manure, when it is spread on the ground, oftentimes on farm fields as a quote unquote organic fertilizer, which is not necessarily organic because it, in, 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 it entails uh, uh, lots of products, so uh, uh, antibiotics and uh, uh, the, the chemicals that they use to to wash the uh, wash the material equipment and the machinery and the uh, and the stalls with, and they put that in this manure lagoon and then they spread it on the ground as a fertilizer. Uh, and depending upon the uh, nature of the depth of bedrock, the nature of the bedrock underneath the soils, uh, that can go directly to nine uh, to the groundwater, and it's done that in uh, Kiwani County where. Most of the people in Kiwani County have extremely high nitrates. Quite a few of them have E. coli in their water. And it's a largely a result of having too many animals uh, and too much manure. Uh, a good example here of that, I got an email this morning from a friend of mine who, uh, well, actually one of my colleagues up in Door County. And taking Door County, Brown County, and Kiwani County, they have 256,000 cows, most of them in confinement, producing 4.6 million, enough, enough uh, pardon me, enough manure would be equivalent to that produced by 4.6 million people. And uh, they're spreading that on the ground willy-nilly. And, uh, and there are all sorts of, um, difficulties uh, commensurate with that. So the, that idea of co-benefits cuts both ways. Um, there are practices that are good for climate and lots of other things and practices that are bad for climate and lots of other things. So we really want to work on CAFOs. Um, the next slice of the pie that we're going to talk about is grazed lands. If croplands are where we raise plants, grazed lands are where we raise animals, ideally. Um, and a lot of the same practices can be problematic there. So if you spread um, fertilizers or manure um, on your pasture, if you are tilling your pasture, additionally, if you let animals overgraze your pasture um, so that the soil loses its cover, remember healthy soil wants to be covered and uh, pasture plants have a more difficult time recovering, that all produces emissions um, and hurts sequestration as well. There's a little bit of emissions associated with cultivating rice specifically and also burning crop residues, but the next big chunk on the pie chart is a catch-all um, section for energy usage, which is things like fuel for the tractor, running coolers, um, heating animal areas through the winter, things like that. So that's the bad news. That's how agriculture negatively impacts the climate. I want to spend a few slides talking about positive ways that it can impact the climate. So there are a number of practices that can reduce emissions or even sequester carbon and also be good for the farmer. And I group them into a few different categories. From a climate perspective, the best thing that we can, add, we can do is add trees to farms. 
And there are a number of techniques for doing that, and they all have their particular name. In the interest of time, I'm only going to take one example for each of these categories. Below, you will see what is called a silvopasture. So that's a pasture with trees on it. Um, so if you put trees on your grazed lands, um, from a climate perspective, trees are just great. They sequester lots and lots and lots of carbon. Uh, from the farmer's perspective, it provides shade for the animals, which helps them be less stressed, gain weight, be happier, and fetch better prices. And also, you may be able to get a profit off of the trees if they are apple trees, for instance. The next sort of big category are practices that improve soil health. So this is things like not tilling. Um, and the, there's there are a number of ways of doing that. Um, cover cropping is the practice that you see pictured below. Um, what you're seeing is a crop actually being terminated, being killed and laid down in a mat that will block weeds. And then those hoppers on the back of the vehicle there are planting the next crop directly into it, which will benefit from weed suppression and also um, nutrients released by that crop breaking down. And then the final category I want to talk about are things that improve the ecosystem health generally on the farm or around it. Um, the, the benefits for climate are pretty straightforward for that. If you're planting trees or restoring prairie, um, then you're sequestering additional carbon and reducing um, emissions. Farmers can be paid directly for these practices through some conservation programs. They also, um, a healthy ecosystem around the farm will encourage a healthy ecosystem and healthier plants on the farm. Additionally, um, some of these practices can provide habitat for pest predators. So, you know, if you're growing, if you're growing a lot of beets, say, and a woodchuck really likes beets, not that I've had experience with this, um, if you were to provide a habitat for woodchuck predators, that's a win for everybody except the woodchuck. What you see pictured below is called a riparian buffer, um, which is if you have a waterway that's on the farm or close to it, where water from the farm would run off into it, you can plant trees on the banks of that river and they will help filter any water that's coming off of the farm um, and keep that waterway healthy. Um, and that brings us to my favorite part of the presentation, which is where we talk about what we at 350 Wisconsin can do about it. I'm going to shamelessly begin by plugging the Agriculture Policy and Practices team, as well as encourage you to join uh, and get involved with other groups that are working on this as well. The APP team, as for short, um, our main projects right now are visiting growers who use these sustainable climate friendly practices and also pitching stories about them to the media so we can you know create some noise about these really great people and this really cool stuff that is going on um our monthly meetings are every second tuesday of the month which includes next tuesday at 6 30 p.m virtually so if you're interested um, i will drop my email in the chat get in touch and i will send you that link um, I'm going to skip over a little bit because I want to give Harry the opportunity to close us out by talking about the Wisconsin Farmers Union and SRWN. So quickly, the rest of my points, um, the APP team is looking specific, especially for people who are willing to lead projects. We have a, a wish list of things that we wish we could work on, but haven't had the time and people for. So that's doing more to uh, limit the spread of CAFOs work on encouraging large food purchasers to purchase directly from local sustainable producers, and also learn more about policies that we can advocate for that will uh, support sustainable agriculture. Um, there are some things that you can do individually, not necessarily as a group, if that's more your speed. I definitely encourage you to connect with a local sustainable producer. Um, the APP group can help you find them. The Wisconsin Farmers Union, the WFU, has a bunch of them. Uh, there is also an organization called REAP that is Wisconsin-based that publishes a good food almanac online and in print. Um, that's a good way to find people. And the Fair Share CSA Coalition as well. And hopefully now you know about some practices to ask those farmers about to see um, you know, what good things they're doing for the climate. Of course, you can demand local sustainably produced food uh, by buying it yourself. And if you're in the mood to donate to an organization, there's a list 
that would be well worth your dollars. The Savannah Institute, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, Marble Seed, the Nelson Institute, and the Rodale Institute. And now, as promised, I want to give you. Harry a moment. Yeah, Harry, you, Harry has about one minute. Okay, okay, sorry, Harry. Um, if you can we'll tell talk us a little about, about we'll do this yeah. in a question and answer. Yeah. Wisconsin Farmers Union has been around since 1902. Uh, in this state, we are largely Sorry. a sustainable uh, farming organization. Uh, we can talk more about that at some point here. Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network is a coalition of water advocacy groups from all over the state. Uh, we serve as a clearinghouse for information for folks who are encountering uh, new or badly performing uh, CAFOs primarily. Uh, and uh, we've been very successful in helping people to um, oppose these operations. Well done. But 59 well, seconds, is it? <laughs> <laughs> very good. Nice, fast on your feet, Harry. Uh, good wrap up. Excellent presentations from both of you. And we have lots of questions. So I'll get right to those. And if we don't get to them all, they'll spill over into the... Uh, Breakout room. So the first uh, question comes from Don. Uh, Don wants to know, do the emission figures you cited include fossil fuels used by agricultural equipment? And two, what about agricultural food transportation? Are those included in the emissions figures? I believe that those are included in the energy use uh, section of that pie chart. I don't know if uh, if food miles, if the fossil fuels for transporting the food are necessarily. Okay. Um, Don, let me know if that answers your question. And if not, we'll get back at it. Uh, here's another question from uh, Sheila. She wants to know why are CAFOs not required to also build a sewage treatment plant? Because they contribute millions of dollars a year to Wisconsin legislators. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there any possibility of, uh, is, is there a leverage point there or is that battle lost, do you think? I, I'm not sure any battle is actually lost. You know, I think that uh, that's why I continue doing that. I'm, I'm 72 years old and I began this fight uh, 10 years ago and uh, I keep getting more and more involved with it. So if it were a lost cause, I wouldn't continue to do it. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, here's a question from uh, John. Uh, he says, Wisconsin factory farm manure digesters are now being used to offset greenhouse gas emissions from other polluters in other states like California. This is another angle of the many false solutions to climate change that are being promoted in the current farm bill debate. Many groups, including the Family Farm Defenders, are opposed to these types of offset proposals. Do you have any uh, reaction, Mike or Harry? Well, my first reaction is I know the person who was uh, who's speaking there. Because I've heard him say that before, and he's a personal friend. <laughs> and it's really true. The um, uh, one of the reasons that some of these outfits, uh, some of these installations, are profitable. And probably the only reason they're profitable is because of either government subsidies or carbon, carbon offsets from other parts of the country. Um, so it doesn't solve the problem. It just kicks a can down the road. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would just add to that that I, I, I don't know. The, the science enthusiast in me really likes the idea of digesters, um, but there, I have seen our like news articles um, about how digesters have allowed capos to discontinue expanding. Um, so it it's not just a theoretical problem; it has actually happened already. Okay, thank you, Mike. Here's a uh, well. Before I get to Ken's question, um, and maybe we'll be able to ask this question in the final few minutes, or we'll hold it over for the uh, breakout room. But I would like both Mike and Harry to talk about um, 
what they think the greatest challenge is for the work you do at the scale you work at. Um, what are some of the most satisfying things that you've uh, achieved? And we'd also like to hear about where you think the leverage points are. So we'll get to Ken's question. Uh, Ken wants to know what portion of cropland soil emissions are from fertilizer uh, excess? What, what happened? There he goes. From fertilizer excess versus tilling or other factors. I'm asking as there is a federal legislation recently submitted to support expansion of precision agriculture, which could reduce applications 30 to 40%. Uh, Mike or Harry, either one of you have a reaction to this? You know, I've heard I the to... term precision cool. agriculture a number of times. I really don't have a good handle on what all that entails. Okay, maybe Ken will uh, give us a link to that legislation or give us some more uh, information about that. Um, and I'm sorry to say that I don't know the, the specific numbers. Um, of those proportions. Um, I'll see if I can find them because I would like to know. Okay, here's uh, another question from uh, Beth. Um, she says, one, the emphasis on vegan diets seems lacking in understanding that in biomimicry design, animals integrated into a farm system is beneficial. Do you have a view on this? I don't like to get into the uh, vegan versus uh, carnivore uh, conversation. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of information back and forth. I think there's a lot we need to learn. Um, I think that depending on how you raise vegetables, uh, you could be causing nearly as much trouble as feeding animals in confinement. But uh, but I don't know the all, I don't know all the answers about that. And I'd hesitate to make uh, a firm statement. Okay, fair enough. Mike, you have a... I would echo that. Um, and that touches on what I think is one of the greatest challenges is just the complexity um, of this issue as with many in that are, um, are involved in climate change. Um, I'm a vegetarian myself, but as part of this group, I've also, um, it from what I've seen, animals can be integrated in a very, in a way that it integrated into the farming systems in ways that are very, very good for the ecosystem. Um, so as much as I've often heard that the best thing that you can do as an individual for the climate is to be a vegetarian, um, it also, it seems to me that um, animals can actually be a very important part of systems that are good for the climate. Um, and so I, I have considered um, purchasing meat from uh, growers that that raise their animals in a climate smart way. Um, and basically to, to echo Harry's point, um, I, I have heard that a vegan diet is even less impactful on the climate, but I would wanna see more discussion about that. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we have one minute, so I will pose this question to you. Uh, this is from Judy. Uh, she wants to know, what should we be advocating for as the Farm Bill is debated in Congress? And are there any Wisconsin legislators who, should, who we should target with our messages? Oh, I can get the answer about whether there are Wisconsin um, Wisconsin legislators, I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. My immediate answer to what we would advocate for is increased funding for the conservation title. The Farm Bill has a number of pieces of titles and conservation is one of them. No, yeah, I echo that. I think that uh, what a lot of people don't understand is that a great percentage of the, of the Farm Bill's uh, monies are devoted to SNAP, the um, what people used to call food stamps, food share, and uh, and there are lots of folks who, in Congress right now, who are uh, trying to get that money cut, 
And I think that's, um, well, the human being in me doesn't want to see that happen. Okay, we have run out of time, Mike and Harry. You guys did an excellent presentation and really did a good, straightforward job of answering the questions. Uh, there excellent are other question. questions that have come in and we will hold those over uh, for the breakout room. And um, I'll turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you both, Mike and Harry. Thank you. Thank you both. That was very, um, very eye-opening in a lot of ways. So thank you very much. And Steve, if you want to, you may need to somehow uh, share, save that chat if you want to hold it over for the breakout room because you may not be able to access it once you're in the breakout room. And how do I save that? <laughs> um, somebody can somebody can uh, put that in the in the chat to you. Somebody who knows how to do that. Okay. Okay. So if we can have the other slides back, um, Christina. Great. Okay, it's time for the action updates and all of our various updates. So we're going to start off with a special message from John Greenler, our executive director. Thank you so very much, Kelly. Yeah, I'm really uh, excited to give a big shout out and a note of appreciation for Phyllis Hasbrook, who has been staff with us for, well, more importantly, she's been with the organization, with the group, with the community for uh, 10 plus years, been staff uh, since uh, 2016, uh, has been an organizer for the environment, peace and justice since the early 70s. And it's clear that she really has no plans to stop. Um, and just as a personal aside, being on the front lines with Phyllis is always a gift. Uh, she has the innate ability to connect with pretty much anyone. Uh, just as the case in point, like last fall during the election, uh, Phyllis and I were handing out materials to students walking from one class to another uh, and getting them to stop for a moment to talk about climate and voting. Uh, I pride myself actually for being pretty good at this kind of work. And then as I turned around and I watched Phyllis in action, uh, I realized that I had met my match really and then some. She is just so good at engaging people uh, and getting them to uh, uh, really kind of go deep on the topics on hand. So, uh, so many different ways uh, that Phyllis has been invaluable to our community and we look forward to her continuing, continuing on. So thank you so very much for all that you do, Phyllis, all that you brought to this organization and this community. And as I said, we look forward to more. So yeah, big cheers, so. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. So now moving on to our, our other announcements. So starting with Maddie Loeffler, um, who's representing our 350 Wisconsin um, Action Affiliate. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm Maddie, 350 Wisconsin's Office Administrator, um, and I've been working with staff and volunteers at our 501c4 350 Wisconsin Action to get out the vote. Um, and the election happens to be tomorrow. Um, so if you have voted early, thank you. And if you have yet to vote, you can register and vote in person tomorrow, um, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and our final push is tomorrow, um, phone banking from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Zoom. Um, so you can sign up using the link I am about to put in the chat. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Maddie. I want to ditto Maddie's uh, appreciation for all that have been involved. And one just last you know, final push for some relational organizing. If you can reach out to some folks who you think may or may not be voting, uh, definitely give them the nudge. This, this election, it's hard to emphasize too much how important this election is and how many people who are out there who still don't fully appreciate uh, getting, uh, getting especially Janet Protasiewicz into the state Supreme Court uh, seat. So thank you all again. And Susan Nossel will be putting in a couple of resources into the chat as well. Um, and anybody who has not yet voted, just make sure that you um, look at what's on the ballot well before you go in there, because there's a lot of referenda on that ballot. So um, you definitely want to make sure you, you um, have your answers before you go into the ballot. Okay, next we have Gail Nordheim, our president of our board, going to talk about our annual meeting. Uh, good evening. Uh, yeah, I'm. 
I just wanted to make a brief announcement um, reminding you to put on your calendar June 5th at seven o'clock. It's the same time as our regular monthly meeting, but this will be a uh, our annual meeting that we have every year. And it will be a hybrid meeting. Um, you could come in, in person to the Friends Meeting House in Madison, or you could join on Zoom. Next slide, please. Um, it's a good opportunity. We'll have our teams report on their accomplishments over the last year and their plans going forward. Uh, we'll be presenting our new uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice plan that a number of uh, that staff and volunteers have been working on really hard over the last few months, and it'll be it will be presented. We'll be announcing some forthcoming staff changes, and then there will be elections to the board and the coordinating council. Next slide, please. So for the board and the coordinating council, uh, per, per our bylaws, there are certain rules about who could vote. And what the bylaws say is that you, uh, you must have been a member for 45 days before the election. So 45 days before the election is April 21st. So if you want to vote, make sure that you've donated at least $5, ideally somewhat more, but at least $5 between June 1st, uh, 2022 and April 21st of this year. Um, if that's a problem, you could also vote if you've attended at least three monthly meetings in the last year. And if that's the case, uh, send an email to the contact at 350wisconsin.org let them uh, you know, say which meetings you attended and you'll be added to the eligible voter roll. If you are uncertain whether you've donated, you could, you could send an email to that, um, to that address and we could check and let you know. So we look forward to seeing you at the monthly meeting on June 5th. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Gail. So um, next we have Diane Bracash from the Art Collective. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, what a great presentation, Mike and Harry. I just want to give a shout out. Um, so yes, we, we want to encourage all of you who are able to, to join us, join all of 350 at the um, Farmer's Market on Saturday, April 22nd. That is Earth Day. There will be some things happening beginning at um, around 10 a.m. And we so would love to have your presence there, not only to you know, hand out flyers or be a tabler or whatever, but just to be a friendly face in the crowd. And it, it's, it's something that's gonna be very celebratory, gonna have a very clear message, but um, it's kind of, it's a big kickoff to our outside action. Um, season. So we would really, really love to have you. Uh, there will be, Russ and I will be, as well as other people, part of the breakout. So um, after this, so if you have questions about this, want to get involved or learn more, um, we'll be there. I can talk to you then. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Diane. Seth Jensen is going to, from the Divested to Fund team, is going to tell us about a couple more things you can be a part of. Thank you, Kelly. So everyone who attended this meeting tonight is very fortunate not only to have heard that really inspiring presentation on climate change and agriculture, but also because you get a somewhat exclusive invitation to uh, join uh, mem other members of the 350 Wisconsin community in welcoming George Lakey. He is going to be in Madison on April 10th. And um, just a, a real quick kind of bio of Lakey. He is a writer. He is a veteran of numerous movements, um, actions going all the way back to the civil rights movement, but he's also just an amazing storyteller. And the opportunity to be in his presence is uh, uh, kind of a treasure that I would um, encourage everyone to take advantage of. 
So as the slide says, it's a morning, morning affair, 9.30 a.m. at the Quaker Meeting House. It would be lovely to see all your faces there, if possible. <clears throat> And Seth, you want to tell us about the other actions? Oh my gosh. Well, um, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, uh, so Lakey's visit will be preceding a series of um, actions at banks um, that are funding fossil fuels and therefore contributing to the climate crisis. And they will be happening during Earth Week. Um, so yes, for more information about that, please email the email address um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, one of Lakey's most recent actions that he was a part of was a uh, rocking chair blockade of a Chase Bank. And um, we're gonna um, really be inspired by that to do similar things um, <clears throat> during Earth Week. Sounds great. And if you wanna know more about some of these actions, we will have a breakout group tonight um, after the meeting is over that you can join and find out more. So um, uh, Russ, do you, you looks like you have a couple things that you wanted to announce in there too. So if you could jump in and um, do your announcements real quick. Yes, um, I've been working a lot, the, the art collective has been working a lot with the students at the UW for Earth Day this year. And um, I just wanna mention that the, last or the first rather uh friday of the five fridays before earth day was a fantastic success we hope you can come out to uh east campus mall it's a walkway between johnson street and uh university the specific address is 333 east campus mall there is uh public parking in the building there but you have to access us on access it on the lake street side um because of the weather this last Friday, we postponed uh, it. The, th the theme is foods for this coming week, but we're also combining it with uh, the already planned theme of water. Um, and there's gonna be lots of free food, lots of uh, stuff like tomato plants given away, lots of food given away. Uh, Dahi Wolf the Fiddler is gonna lead us in some songs. Um, there's an indigenous person from Wong Sheik Collective that is gonna be doing a land acknowledgement and talking about line five. I think Alex from 350 is gonna be talking about line five. Um, then the next week is one that 350 is helping organize on the concepts of um, shelter and home. And we've got a couple of really outstanding people coming to talk about that. Um, the next Friday after that is uh, the 21st and that is the concept of future. And then on Earth Day itself, after we've done the amazing thing that Diane is putting together uh, at 10 o'clock on uh, Earth Day at the, at the farmer's market, at noon, there's something that's going to be starting at Library Mall and going up State Street that is our biggest build ever. And uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. So uh, if, if you don't want to march all of State Street, you could just stay up there. I think we'll get there around 1230 or 1 o'clock. So thank you. I really hope you'll show up. I think we're going to get some young blood in 350. They've been or in, yes, in 350 because the students have really enjoyed working with us. Thanks. So Russ, if you could put any of that into the chat, that would be really helpful. People would like it to have that written down so they can have access to some of that if you can. Will do. Thanks. Okay. And um, Seth, if you could also put it into the chat, if the George Lakey talk is going to be available on Zoom or not. Okay, so let's go to Susan Millar from the Community Climate Solutions team. Well, greetings, and uh, I wanted to celebrate what a great job the, the art folks are doing uh, this month. Um, and I also want to celebrate that uh, the City of Madison's Common Council has just passed a Building Energy Savings Ordinance. This is an ordinance that passed unanimously by all of our alders. It was rejected in 2014 by the, basically the Chamber of Commerce, but uh, a lot of folks from CCST and beyond um, really put a big push in and we got all the elders to vote for it. Uh, it's, a, it's a big win. And um, there's also a big win in that the city of Madison's Common um, Council has just passed an affordable housing bonus. The reason that's important is because cities are moving towards more dense, dense and equitable housing particularly in the downtown area. And because it's dense, the um, emissions per 
inhabitant go way down, uh, partially due to um, the fact that folks are not using single occupancy vehicles and also because they are in uh, denser housing. So uh, again, those are the sorts, some of the some of the things that the community climate solutions teams are focusing on in addition to the fabulous work that our Dane County Community Working Group is doing, as you just heard. So, uh, and I just wanted to also mention that um, if you're interested in doing other local things having to do with green transportation, such as advocating to get our local school districts using electric buses or um, finding ways to get developers to install geothermal wells before they put in those big old buildings that are going to be there for 50 or 60 years and so forth, please uh, just contact me or any other member of um, the Community Climate Solutions team. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Susan. Nice to hear those wins. Okay, and now it's time for Nikki to do our, announce our Volunteer of the Month. Hello, everyone. I'm here as the Volunteer Coordinator, and I am happy to announce that our volunteer of the month for April is Marian Friedel. Yay, Marian! Clap, clap, clap. Um, Marian, you definitely see her here today because not only is she a member of the monthly meeting team, uh, but she does so, so many other things as well. So a couple of major things that have happened even just recently uh, is that she has been working really hard on our election work, phone banking, uh, signing up for shifts, getting those calls. You know, we need to call as many people as possible. You all know how important this election is. And Marion has been an absolute rock star in this regard. Uh, not only that, but at the same time as we are dealing with the elections, uh, 350 Wisconsin as a whole has been going through a very intensive Justice, Equity, Diversion, and Inclusion program through Cream City Conservation Corps. And Marion is a huge part of making that happen, pushing these initiatives forward, being on teams that are working on next steps. And it is not a small thing. You know, we are meeting about these things three to six hours a week, something like that. <laughs> and Marion is always there with a cheery attitude. Uh, always ready to jump in and find something that she is able to help out with uh, and so willing uh, to put forth her time, effort, and expertise in all of these areas. Um, she also co-leads our climate justice team. You know, she does so much. It is absolutely so well-deserved that Marion is uh, being recognized here. So thank you so much for everything that you've been doing uh, and continue to do for 350 Wisconsin. We really, really appreciate you, Marion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you so much, Marion. Um, stick with it, Marion. We don't want to lose you. Don't get burned out. Okay, now we have a number of announcements from Phyllis. Okay, hold on. So I'm um, Phyllis, co-chair of the Tar Sands team for just a little bit longer. And as part of our campaign to shut down Enbridge Line 5, I'm here to tell you about a bunch of amazing activities that will be held this fall during Labor Day weekend at the Straits of Mackinac in defense of the Great Lakes. It's a long way off, but because 20,000 people often attend, you will want to reserve a room or a camping spot soon if you want to attend. So as you can see here, there will be a feast, a light brigade display, the pipe out, paddle out, which is a kayaking event, and the Water is Life Music Festival. And finally, next slide, please the uh, amazing annual bridge walk across the straits, sometimes as many as 25,000 people led by the governor, that's her in blue, and the Lieutenant Governor of Michigan. And if you want to keep informed about these events, uh, you can go to communitiesunitedbywater.org, which I will drop in the chat in just a bit. Um, the following three minute video clip that we're gonna show you is from an excellent 16 minute video about the need to shut down line five before it poisons the Great Lakes. And it focuses on the Michigan groups and nations fighting it, but we are all part of the same struggle. And I'm hoping that after seeing this, you will watch the whole thing and then share it with friends. 
and someone is going to drop in the link into the chat where you can see the whole thing, but don't do it right now uh, because you don't want to be playing while this one is playing. Um, and then one last announcement is watch out for an article in our soon to be published newsletter, e-newsletter, about the recently resurrected riot bill, which we need Governor Evers to veto again. Uh, do not assume that we can just depend on him to do so. Please read the short article and then contact the governor. Our right to peaceful assembly is at stake. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phyllis. All right, here's the video clip. Hopefully the sound comes through. <laughs> and I didn't know it was there. I was appalled. And then when I found out how old and decrepit it was and how unneeded and everything else, it's just like, this is criminal. We have to do something about this. Well, the, the pipeline's corroded. It could burst at any time. It it's, wasn't built to last this long. And it's in a horrible area with strong currents. So it's, it's just very vulnerable. So that, that pipeline, if it was to break, it would devastate this area. I know that if there was an oil spill that happened in the streets of Mackinac, there would be nothing we could do to stop it. And so when we're talking about December or January and there's three feet of ice covering the streets, there's nothing we can do to break through that in order to stop an oil spill. And what's going to happen is it'll bloom beneath the ice and spread even further as the current pulls it underneath. And so without a proper safety plan in place, without even being able to answer the question of what you would do when there is ice coverage, it's just further evidence of why we can't trust Enbridge and why we can't trust their safety record either. It's not safe to be extracting it in the first place. Moving it anywhere is not safe. You know, Line 5 is particularly egregious example of infrastructure that's handling fossil fuels because it's going under the Straits of Mackinac. That's a big problem, but there's also well over a hundred other water crossings that are close to the lakes. But it's terrible because we're putting, we're putting so much at risk for a profit for a Canadian corporation. And it's so bad that they don't want the tunnel or any, they don't want to go through their lands. Canada's pushing for it to come to us. They're invoking their own treaty rights to stop it because they don't want it. And also these waters, the water moves fast, the, the flow moves back and forth. We have storms, we have anchor strikes, we have all kinds of things. It's just an absolute miracle that it's held up this long. And it's a ticking time bomb and it's absolutely appalling. And it's such a pristine area. This, this pipeline, it, it just needs to be decommissioned and no tunnel, it needs to be removed. Um, it should have been removed years ago and it should have never been allowed. And we know that pipelines spill and they leak. <laughs> How can something like that, going through a body of water that many millions of people depend on in the largest <laughs> freshwater region <laughs> in the world, how can that be safe? When Enbridge talks about safety, I can't believe them because their track re record represents it, um, as well as um, I think their disregard for indigenous communities because if they really cared, if they really were concerned about the Great Lakes, about our water or about our land, they wouldn't have ran the pipeline here in the first place. Thanks for sharing that video, Phyllis. Mm -hmm. I recommend everyone watch. I think it's really powerful. Hey, Phyllis, do you want to tell them about the May meeting? I do. So, um, whoops, what just happened there? Okay. So next, uh, a month from today, more or less, Monday, May 1st, a virtual meeting like this one is called Learning from Water Protectors in Minnesota. And that's Victoria McMillan of the McGeezy clan, Anishinaabe Nagachiwanok, and Jamie Gaither, a retired metallurgical engineer turned climate justice advocate. They are two of the many volunteers, citizen scientists, they call themselves, with Wadukawad Amikwag, which means those who help beaver. And the beavers are doing their best, but they do need help there to recover the land that and waterways that have been destroyed by Enbridge in northern Minnesota when Line 3 was rammed through there last year. And now they are 
as scientists, they are taking samples, they, are, they have drone flights, they are gathering evidence and showing it to the agencies in Minnesota to see this is what Enbridge has done. And the agencies, none of them are doing it themselves and they are glad to have the info. We'll see if they do anything useful with it, but they say they're very glad to have it. And um, the one big reason that Jamie and Victoria are doing this is to help us to, to say, don't let it happen to Wisconsin, what happened to our land and water in, in Minnesota. And so we, I'm so glad that they're going to come and talk about the work that they do. And I hope everybody will come and invite your friends. Yes, thank you, Phyllis, for uh, bringing our attention to them. They, they should be really interesting speakers. So that's it for the, um, for the meeting announcements. And so uh, at this point, I'd like to um, welcome all of our newcomers. I see a lot of names in the, um, in the participants list here that I'm not familiar with. So um, we welcome you to come to our meetings, to follow us on social media, check out our website. Um, we um, have lots of things on our website and um, we welcome your financial contributions if you wanna um, do that. But we also would welcome you to consider joining one of our many, many teams that we have. Um, we have lots of options for people to get involved at lots of different levels. And so we're going to go over um, some of the meetings that, that come up. Um, a lot of our teams meet on Mondays. So as you can see here, Tar Sands, Climate Justice, community, the communications team, and Divest into Fun all meet on Mondays, but different Mondays. So you could join all of them if you wanted to. Um, and we will, we'll be putting all these into the chat as well. And then we have our other teams the um, CCST that Susan talked about, the Art Collective, this, we have a state policy team that you did not hear about tonight, or the fundraising team. And then of course we have the monthly meeting planning team as well. All of these um, are things we would love to have you get involved in any of these as much as you can. Um, so um, if you are interested in some of these, then you have the chance in right after um, we close out here to meet with Nikki Draga and she can she Nikki can answer any questions you have about 350 Wisconsin um, and specifically if you have questions about some of those teams so um, we also will have these two other breakouts um, one to talk further with the speakers which I have a feeling a lot of people are going to go to um, and the other is for the April actions so um, just a final reminder to uh, please come on May 1st to hear about the, um, the pipeline, uh, the water protectors from Minnesota, and then also to come on the June meeting when we are going to have our annual meeting. So um, please stay on uh, on the main room if you're going to be um, stay talking with Nikki and Susan Millar or Susan Nossel is going to be um, setting up the, the breakout rooms. <coughs> so Susan, if you could get those up, then we can show people how they can click on which room they want to go into. So you can choose to go into room one for Q&A or room two for the April actions. And if for some reason you can't uh, do that yourself, Susan <coughs> can move you into a room if you put it into the chat. So yeah, um, folks. yeah so it looks like you like, um, yeah, you can move yourself in, and if you can't, just put something in the chat. And put something in the chat, yeah, if you're not yeah. sure how to get there. Okay, thank you all, and um, don't forget to vote tomorrow. Marion, you can probably stop the recording.